Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. In past shows on trauma stewardship, I shared that often part of our work as practitioners requires us to listen to, sit with, and hold with our patients stories of significant challenge trauma, and very distressing, painful, and often unthinkable and profoundly sad experiences. It's a big ask professionally, but it's part of our therapeutic commitment and what we've signed up for and agree to lean into to help folks work through these life experiences that are preventing them from experiencing their fullest possible life. In working with trauma, self-care is critical, essential really to the longevity within our career, as well as necessary for us to be effective in our work. And that's why I'm so excited today to talk about trauma-informed work and the opportunities for self-care within ourselves and also within the community with Dr. Guy McPherson. Guy holds his doctorate in clinical psychology and has spent the last several years studying the impact and treatment of trauma and early psychosis. In 2014, Guy founded the Trauma Therapist Project with the goals of raising the awareness of trauma and creating an educational and supportive community for new trauma workers. The Trauma Therapist Project has now grown to include the Trauma Therapist Podcast, now being listened to in more than 160 countries around the world and is downloaded more than 100,000 times per month. Incredible as well as a Trauma Therapist 2.0, which is an online membership community specifically dedicated to educating and inspiring trauma workers just starting out in their trauma-informed journey. Guy's focus and passion is on creating a vibrant global community for support, education, and to inspire new trauma workers, as well as to help improve the present way that trauma is taught at the graduate level. Guy, welcome to our show today. Thanks, Graham. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. I'm excited as well. Let's do so it. Nice to, let's do it, brother. <laughs> well, hey, guy, your trauma project, your trauma therapist project, and the resources provided get a great community. You, you talk about kind of, you describe it as a tribe in a really nice way for those working with trauma or those that want to become more trauma informed. And your program provides some great support, some education, as I mentioned, and some real inspiration in working in this aspect of our field. Tell me what work professionally with trauma in your life has led you to to create this community for other professionals working in this area or wanting to come into this area? Yeah. You know, when I got into graduate school, I knew I wanted to focus on trauma. I had started out as someone who was really creative. I mean, not that I'm not now, but that was my focus. I, I went to art. I started out at art school. I was playing music. And then I started writing fiction and I was writing fiction for a long time. And I had been working on a novel. And I remember this was maybe, I don't know, 10, 11, 11 years ago or so. And I was in Los Angeles. I was living with my sister at the time and done for the day. And I was sitting in my room and it was kind of afternoon and the phone rang. And I, it was this call from a friend of mine that, I had worked with uh, a few years previously in San Francisco and she, uh, we had lost contact, but it turned out Graham that she in that moment was calling her friends to let them know that she had been living with AIDS for the last nine years and she was calling to say goodbye. And as I was listening to this phone call, talking to her, I was thinking to myself, this woman has so much strength, has so much courage. And I can hear the way she was dealing with it. And I was thinking to myself, there's no way that I would have this much courage or strength. And I swear, when I got off that phone with her, I felt like this giant telephone pole, this fiery telephone pole was shot through my gut because I felt like I was not living. I was yeah. writing about what I wanted to live, you know, about these, these adventures and so forth and finding oneself. But I felt like there was a huge disconnect. Mm. And when I got off the phone, I felt like I needed to find my strength, my gut, my courage, like the courage that she had. So what mm. I ended up doing is I started going on these 
these adventures really to, to test myself. And one of these was a survival course. Mm -hmm. And I, believe me, I'm not a mountain man or a survival man by any stretch of the imagination. But on mm -hmm. this course, there were 15 of us strangers. And like day two, one of the participants got really sick. Mm -hmm. And myself and this other girl, we kind of stepped up and we helped this guy. We encouraged him. We, we dragged him. And that was the moment was like, this is what I want to do. I want to help people in these dire circumstances. And you know, you, before we started recording, you had asked about my own trauma and I didn't make the connection. You know, we can talk about that, but yes. I wanted to, to do this. So I ended up going back to school, getting my, my undergraduate degree. I thought about becoming a doctor. I switched to psychology and go. trauma was it. When I got into graduate school, I wanted to focus on trauma. And, you know, for me, I was a little late to school. I mean, going back to school, I think it was like 34 or 35 or 36 at the time. You know, I had gone to therapy. I, I thought I had things dialed in. And when I got to graduate school, the answer for me was, you know, I thought I needed to take in all this information, you know, yeah. what book do I need to read? What workshop do I need to attend? Who on this, the faculty has a trauma background that I right. need to connect with that's going to help make me the, the, the most trauma informed, the best trauma therapist I could become. And what I neglected was really the understanding of my own inner work, my own authenticity and genuineness. Not that I didn't think those things existed, but I didn't realize the importance, the significance that those things played within the therapeutic relationship, yes. and especially when working with trauma. And let me just say this one more thing, if I can, because I am no, go kind of going off here. What happened was I was, you know, I started seeing clients as a, as a, as a student and so forth in my, in my training and so forth. And I was doing a lot of commuting. I was doing about literally an hour and a half back and forth each way. And I was listening to these podcasts and I was listening to these podcasts of entrepreneurs who, who were like doing really incredible things with their lives. And I was really inspired. And at the same time, while I was driving, I was thinking about my clients. Why aren't these people listening to me? Why aren't, why aren't, you know, I'm taking trauma courses. I'm taking these workshops. How come they're not listening to me? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm not cut out for this. And I thought to myself, you know, at one point it struck me like, wouldn't it be cool if I put together a, a podcast and I could help other people like myself who didn't know what the heck they were doing, but yeah. who were interested in trauma. And that's, that's how it started. I love that guy. Why, why trauma though? You know, we go into, we go into our schooling and there's, you know, various ways we can work kids, marriages, you know, institutional, whatever we can do, just a really a variety of areas of psychology. That's what makes it such a beautiful field. Why trauma? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a good question. In part, it was because I felt that I could, when I talked about that survival course and going in there, I felt like I could help, quote unquote, help people or be with people or walk yeah. with people who were in dire circumstances. Yeah. I didn't know how, I didn't know yeah. why. And you know, it's funny, as soon as you answered that question, mm -hmm. it brought me back to when I was with my brother and he was being picked on at an early time in his life. And I remember seeing that and wanting to help, but not being able to. He Later, he went on to become a Navy SEAL. I didn't have to worry too much about him. But, you know, and I had my own trauma when I was growing up. I was bullied that that, that just really impacted the trajectory of my life in terms of yes. how I showed up in relationships, my yeah. self-esteem and so forth. So I think those things put together made me, and still to this day, really want to be in there with people who were going through certain situations. You know, and in the beginning, I thought that helping meant taking people's pain away or making sure their journey wasn't uh, marred or mired with bumps and so forth. And I, you know, I, I learned and we can talk more about that, what it really meant, but yeah. 
you're talking about, you know, kind of getting in there with folks. And, and I think trauma is a very unique aspect of our field where we get to not necessarily bring people up out of their trauma, but to join them in it. And as we do, we watch them find this path that's, that's uniquely their own. And they get to walk us through their path of healing. There's things we can bring, you know, the, the, the theories and the techniques and the MDRs and all those things that are extremely beneficial in helping folks work through trauma, but it's actually allowing them to not be alone in it anymore right. and to be joined in it anymore. What is fulfilling most about that for you as you yeah. join people well, at that place that they're at? Right. Well, that's another great question. And the thing about that is, Graham, you know, I didn't get that when I first started, because when I first started seeing clients, you know, I had the fortune, I think of when I got into graduate school, really early on, I started taking workshops with sensory motor psychotherapy. So I was getting this great education. Yeah. And I thought that, you know, when I was seeing clients that, well, that was it these interventions and these techniques, those were the things that were, were going to help these people. And it wasn't until I started doing the podcast really. And I started asking the people on the podcast, you know, could you share an early clinical error and what you learned from it? And I thought it was going to be, well, you know, I forgot what Bessel van der Kolk said on page 222, or I forgot this particular technique. And it wasn't like that at all. It was about, you know, I wasn't able to really show up. I, I wasn't able to be my authentic self because of X, Y, or Z. I wasn't able to make that connection. Yeah. And I really opened my eyes because those were the things that I felt, well, of course, those everyone has those things developed and, and so forth. I, I thought it was knowledge. I thought the important thing was what you knew, not who you were in a sense. But that really enabled me to value who I was and, and what I was and the experiences of I, I had and the imperfections I had, really the human beingness of it all, to quote one of my guests, Manuel, Manuela Mishka reads, you know, and it's that it's being able to, to sit there when I was seeing clients, being able to, to sit there and to value that beingness, you know, yeah. and to be comfortable with that and to own the fact that I don't know every friggin' thing that's going on, right. but, and, and for that to be okay, because people who've been traumatized, right? Oftentimes that genuineness has been ripped from them. That, that authenticity has been ripped from them. They oftentimes they've been, if we're talking about you know, abuse or sexual abuse, oftentimes those types of activities take place in supposed environments of safety and yeah. comfort. So to be able to recreate a true genuineness, which doesn't mean perfection and having all the answers, to me, I, I value that because I could be myself in a sense. Yeah. I love this theme. And you said it before, I want to highlight it. And I want to kind of actually read something off of your site that I find to be very cool. It's this idea of appreciating what we bring. It's not the theories, although those are important, and the knowledge base, those are essential, and some of the things that we can incorporate in a treatment. It's the relationship. You say in your site, when I got to graduate school, it was all about what trauma book I need to read or what workshop I need to attend that was going to help me be the best trauma therapist I could be, both of which are crucial, you say. But what I missed was how much I mattered in the therapeutic process. And by what I mean you're saying is how much my self-awareness mattered and how integral my own authenticity and presence mattered in doing this work. I know that oftentimes when I'm working with folks, we'll kind of sit there and sometimes we just find ourselves stuck, you know, and we're just sitting in something that's really hard and you can't get out of those moments. And maybe you don't need to, maybe you get to sit there with somebody and just kind of hold this hope that, and this belief that somehow when it's right, we're going to find a way or make a way to get ourselves through this. But in the meantime, we get to sit with this and understand it together. And you actually, as you emphasize this part of the you that the therapist brings, you even have a, a resource on your site. You've got a great site and you've got Appreciate this cool ebook. It's called the inner work ebook. I think you sell it for a very manageable price. I think like $9, I think. And it's an element that you're saying is equally important to learning about the neurobiology of trauma, which maybe we can touch a little bit about today. But the other part is the you, 
that you bring. And that's what you're emphasizing here. And I think I would imagine in your tribe that uh, this community you work with, this is a significant emphasis that you bring to uh, encouraging people to appreciate that part of the relationship itself. That can be as curative as these other approaches we're talking about. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right on there. And in, in fact, you know, a lot of my guests who are super seasoned say that exact same thing, you know, and this was something that, that I had to learn because I, I didn't value that aspect. I didn't yeah. think that I was good enough, that I felt that I was good enough if I had all of this knowledge. And again, like you said, of course that's crucial, yeah. but you know, someone sitting there in front of you, they don't care. You know, they want to be able to, to make that connection, which is so valuable. And, you know, one of my guests, I remember he said, his name is Joseph Bobro. He's a clinical psychologist. And he said, you know, when you're in session with someone and working with someone who's been traumatized, you are going to get triggered. It's going to happen, but you have to have done your own inner work, the self-exploration, you know, trying to work through, I'm putting all these things in quotes, of your own trauma. Because if you end up in a room with someone and you're working on your own stuff, you're in the wrong room, right? Yeah. You should be in your own therapist's room. I'd love to, I'd love to kind of ping off of that with you. And I'd like to go down this path and have you take us down this path just a wee bit more in depth, if you would. I, I couldn't agree with you more that as therapists, one, we are our greatest own tool, along with the knowledge base and everything else. It's the relational piece that we get to bring. And along with this knowledge of psychology, we ourselves, I believe, are the cornerstone part of that healing process that you're emphasizing here. But it's like you're saying, it's important for us to state in our work with trauma that our stuff is going to get kicked up, whether it's our stuff or not, something's going to be emotionally triggering for us, maybe hijacking of something. And if we haven't got our own stuff worked out, it's going to leak into the work. It could look like, hey, I'm getting kind of triggered unconsciously, and I'm not going to go down the path that the patient needs me to go down with them right now to help them heal. Or maybe I might emphasize some areas that I don't want to deal with in my life, but I'm going to do my work through them. And it's going to be maybe traumatizing them because I'm going to be emphasizing things that they're not ready for yet. Maybe it's premature. Right. The way we're talking about you know, our own stuff, our kind of our own counter-transferential things that get kicked up. So given this, share your thoughts with me again, and this is a path I want you to go down a little bit more, of the importance for us as therapists to do our own work in therapy prior to and even throughout this work that we do so that stuff doesn't come in counter-transferentially. And what is your concern about those that don't do their work? Right. Well, I think, you know, uh, most people who get into this field have the best intention, the great intention. Absolutely. They want to help. They want to heal, you know, and this is where you start having to really, I think, define your terms. What do you mean by help? And what do you mean by heal? And, and I certainly wanted to fix, you know, and help and push. And a lot of therapists, when they start out, they, they, they naturally want to do this. With the best of intentions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I had to learn again <laughs> through the podcast and, and having these people on who were a hell of a lot more seasoned than, than I ever was say, one person said to me, I'll never forget this. You know, who are you to, to think that you should take that person's pain away Yeah, to take them off their journey? And I initially thought, well, isn't that the, the goal here? Right. And of course, when you're first starting out, I think it's easy to think that it is. But I had to learn that there's so much value in being able to honor someone's own process. Someone else said mm -hmm. to me, before that person walks in your room, they started their healing journey yes. many, many hours or years or days before they even got to you. And to be able to get to a place where you're able to own that and see that, I think it requires a certain abandonment of your ego. Like you're going to come in or I'm going to come in and fix. I'm the therapist, right? You're the yes. client. And that, that, I thought that too. I have this knowledge. I have this degree. I'm gonna of help course, you. I know more. And oftentimes I think that 
people and not everyone, I'm not saying it, but I'm saying a lot of people. And, and I know this because I've talked to a lot of people on my podcast and certainly myself too, when they start out, they don't realize how much the, the process is about them. It's not just about the client because you're walking into that room. And if you haven't looked at your own traumas or, or try to work through them or dance through them or understood what your biases are, what your fears are, like you said, Graham, they will come up in that yeah. room. You know, when I first started, I was working at a clinic in Northern California and we were assessing and treating young individuals who were showing early signs of psychosis. And 99.9% .9 of those individuals, not surprisingly, had trauma. And here I was, newly minted with my degree and, you know, read all these books and blah, 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 blah. And I felt like I knew stuff and maybe I did, but I certainly didn't know how the heck to create a vital therapeutic relationship. And I got to a point, maybe two years in, when I was working with this other client, we were giving this one young kid an assessment. And this assessment was just a lot of questions, literally it was like 30 page assessment. And it just got to a point in that session where this young individual was just giving these monosyllabic answers. And I, and I took the assessment and I just like put it down, slapped it down, not in anger, but just like, all right, yeah. let's put this down. Right. And at that moment, I just said this internally, I kind of said, this is ridiculous. This is not working. And that client picked up on that. And I said, I said, let's put this down. This is obviously not working. Let me ask you a question. What do all the people your parents, your other therapists, the other doctors that you've seen, what are they not getting? Really good. What are they really not good. hearing? Really and that good. was completely off script. I love that. And I had never done that before. And that opened up the floodgates, not only for the client, but yeah. for me, because it allowed that. me just to be me in that moment. Yeah. What you say in that moment is that this is, this is your experience and this is your journey. Can, can I come alongside you? Exactly. And you, can you help me understand it the way that you've experienced it? I'm going to listen as best I can and try and understand it as best I can. And maybe we can find a way through this together. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Behavioral and mental health professionals provide critical support to our communities in a time when our communities need it more than ever. But they need support too, to continue their education, to connect with colleagues, and to advance their career. And so we've launched Triad, the hub for behavioral and mental health professionals. At Triad, you'll find education, community, and career resources for both current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, all curated specifically for you and all for free. Visit us at hellotriad.com BHT to register for your free professional account. Again, that's hellotriad.com slash BHT. Come join the community today. You know, you're talking about right now, making sure that as therapists, we're committed. It's kind of an ethical responsibility as well, that we do our work so it doesn't become interfering. On the other side of this can be as we sit with and as we listen to and as we lean into these stories that we hear repeatedly, and I'm curious too as to how your project and how your community that you brought together work with this because exposure over time can negatively you know, impact our own mental health as we listen to these stories and, and really adversely affect some of the services that we can provide. It's, we oftentimes refer to it as secondary trauma or a vicarious trauma through the listening of or viewing of the stories that we hear. How do you address that? And what do you guys do in your community to help support each other so that this phenomenon has less of a chance to kind of get a hold of the practitioners that come to see you folks and participate with you? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Another, another good question. You know, first of all, I think providing what I do through the, the community is provide a place for 
specifically newer trauma therapists or therapists who maybe have some experience but are kind of just getting started on their trauma-informed journey in a sense to provide a place where number one we recognize that and we talk about that one of the other elements or one of the elements of the the, the community is these master class interviews i do with Good. with seasoned trauma therapists nice. and we talk about that it's not just about how they're working with clients but how they're impacted and what do they do and i think oftentimes therapists and again i'm, I'm saying this because of a lot of the interviews i've done and a lot of the guests have shared this, that a lot of therapists just give lip service to self-care, you know, and talk about it and suggest it and recommend it for their clients. Don't take it on themselves and understand the importance of it themselves. So I think really to, in response to your question is creating a space in the private Facebook community in this sense of where people can honor that and it be okay and it yes. be expected in a sense you know that 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 making it okay and the expectation that says of course this is going to happen to you you can't get close to these types of things without being affected and if we're all going to be affected and we can be of service to one another and show up and name the fact that these things are going to be heavy and burdensome at times for us to carry we're willing to do it but right. maybe we can carry this with each other and maybe we can encourage each other to carry it in ways that doesn't become affecting to the self as a therapist, nor the relationship with those that we're working with. So I think normalizing it, inviting it, naming it, validating the fact that it happens is really critical. Yeah. Yeah. You, you kind of get me fired up here because I love talking about this stuff. And I think for me, it's about wanting to create a space yeah. where, you know, I can connect with someone genuinely and authentically. You know, I think about when I first started, to me, trauma or the subject of trauma, it was almost like I imagined it to be this fragile glass sphere that I was carrying. And, oh my God, if, I, if I'm walking and I make a mistake, it's going to drop right. and shatter. Or right. I'm going to bump into it and it's shatter. And I learned that it, and the relationship, the therapeutic relationship, and really all relationships in a sense are more to me, at least like this chunk of clay that I'm going to slip, at, but that's okay. This is maybe going to get dented or it's going to, it's going to jump up against my, or it's hit up against my shoulder and it's going to get a little nick, but yeah. all that gives it character in a sense yeah. and gives it even more life and texture. And I can own that and, and I can hold that. And there's no fear in that moment. Yeah. And when you say it that way, sometimes we forget that these folks with trauma, they are far more resilient than often we can ever appreciate. And sometimes far more resilient than they even appreciate. Part of our work is to say, how in the world did you find a way through that? Because right. that's incredible strength to me. And right. so it's not this glass kind of slipper or this, you know, it, it's, it's a lot more resilient and we can, we're going to ding and nick the, you know, the therapeutic process at times, but there's something hearty about it, isn't it? That we can lean into and kind of really work, work that clay, if you will. Right. And I think when that happens, there's a certain amount of fearlessness that enters yes. into the therapeutic yes. relationship. And believe me, when I first started, I was, I was scared, not just scared as, as a newer clinician, but I was scared about trauma. Even though I wanted to do this, I was fearful that maybe I would hear something yes. that was, would freak me out, or I'd work with some kid and they would tell me some sexual abuse story that would just freak me out. Yeah. And, you know, none of that really transpired. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this had, so much of this has to come from within ourselves, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. No, that's good, man. That's good. You know, we are kind of getting kind of a good lather here going with each other. And, and I think professionally, those that are listening, our colleagues are going to, I think, groove with this as well. I want to take you into something kind of a, a little bit of a shift in the time we have remaining for those who might be listening outside, kind of being practitioners and clinicians. But I'm curious for you to kind of walk through a two minute drill with me. And I want you to share with me from your experience now, how you think about the following. Given your experience, define for me what trauma is. 
Okay. Well, initially when I first started out, to me, I, I thought trauma had this kind of crisp definition. You know, it resulted from sexual abuse or resulted from an automobile accident or combat, period. Yes. And what I've grown to really understand and learn is that it's more on a continuum. You know, and yeah. what can be traumatic for one person isn't necessarily going to be traumatic for another person. And in part, that's another reason why I started doing what I'm doing. Because a lot of people you know, weren't realizing that, well, bullying could be traumatic or Absolutely. witnessing to domestic violence could be traumatic for that one person. Yeah. So it, trauma, it, it, in a sense, can be defined by, you know, an experience or happening or an event or something that disrupts someone's, someone's being, someone's nervous system, in a sense, and they can be traumatic. And, you know, post, post-traumatic stress disorder has its own definition, sure. its own a list of symptoms in the, in the DSM and so forth, but it, it, it's, it's a broader definition. Let me run something. Let me run just a quick definition that I use or by you, see what you think. I'd, I'd appreciate your feedback. I say it's an, it's an event or events outside the realm of normal experience. Meaning if I'm supposed to have a safe environment within which I grow up and it's not, or my attachments aren't what they're supposed to be, if you will, in a perfect world, Anything that deviates from that is going to affect me, isn't it? It's going to affect my future attachments, like you said earlier, the way that I see myself. Severe events, naturally, are going to be outside the realm. Maybe my safety, my attachments, the relationships and the way they tend to go, those early environments. Those can all be traumatic experiences. Shapiro talks about the big T's and the little T's, big traumas, little traumas, not to minimize the effect of them in any way, but sometimes the bigger T's, like the 9-11s, like a war veteran, those are easy to... I don't know if I like that word, but they're easy to see. They're, they're, they're there. You're attacked, those kinds of things, been jumped, et cetera. The small T's could be a rupture in a relationship. Someone, maybe a parent who has their own trauma that doesn't know how to show up for you. If you've watched on YouTube, the, the still-faced experiment, mm. you see the importance of healthy mirroring. And if that's not happening in your life, that impacts us, doesn't it? That's outside the realm of normal experiences, what we should be getting mm. for our healthy and full development. That's a long way around the barn, brother. But what do you think about that? Yeah, I'd agree. And I think what that does, that definition, I think, honors people's experience. You know, you. It, it allows people to say, yeah, that did screw me up, you know, and, and that's how I am feeling now. It wasn't just the fact that I, you know, was in a car accident or had this crazy 9-11 experience or whatever. Right. That right. stuff did screw me up. Yes, it I did. Mean, being bullied myself. A lot of people are like, bullied? Come on, kids are going to be yeah. kids. Blah, 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 blah. Man, that jacked me up. Yes. And only now can I say that in, on this podcast. Before yes. I was like, I can't talk about that. I was too scared of how I'm going to be perceived or whatever. But it did, man. And I can yeah. see it and feel it. Yeah, I, I agree. I would love to come back. I want to seed an idea with you. And I, I'd love to come back. We have a, a component of our podcast that we call it the clinicians series, where we take folks that listen in behind the therapeutic door to see what actually goes on to let them understand, kind of demystify the whole therapeutic process. Telling some stories confidentially, of course, but telling stories about how people work through these things and what they experience, what's it like to be the therapist in those moments. I would love to come back and talk about some of these things because you're leaning into those right now. I know it's got a little bit of time left. I want to ask one more two minute drill question. What does it mean to work through trauma? What's that mean? Well, I think, you know, <laughs> I think that could look differently for, for a lot of different people. I, I think initially it means being able to recognize that if someone has experienced trauma to recognize that they have had experienced trauma, yes. that they might have been traumatized by their bullying. And yeah. this is how it's played out. So working through in a sense could mean, it can mean a variety of things. It could mean, yeah. but I first think first it, it means recognizing that you have been traumatized and, and then working through could mean looking at it either through therapy or through whatever other means. But I kind of like to use the word, and this is kind of sounds weird, but walking with it or dancing yeah. with it. I don't want to imply that, that things are always going to be neatly tied up and you're, you're good to go, but it's, it's an ongoing process or can yes, be yeah. an ongoing process, but being able to do that self-exploration 
And if you're a therapist, it, like you said, it's an ethical responsibility. Yeah, that's really good. Really good. Guys, we wind down today. I want you to give a word to our colleagues that are listening into this and, and they're doing some good, you know, some good trauma work, but they may be doing it alone. Speak to that and this community that you'd like to invite them into. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> Uh, if if you are out there, I mean, if you're listening to this and you're working with people who've been impacted by trauma, working in this area alone is very challenging. I mean, we all know it. Working with people who've been impacted by trauma can be traumatizing and disrupting for yourself. I do have a community. I mean, I don't want to do a hard sell here. I'm not like that. No. But if you're interested in yeah. finding other therapists who are also passionate about working with people who've been impacted by trauma, you're welcome to check out my membership community at uh, Trauma Therapist 2.0 and Trauma Therapist 2.com. Trauma Therapist, the number 2.com. But, and even if you don't want to join that, I would recommend finding others who are finding colleagues who are doing this work too, and just having that bounce off and support. It, it's crucial and vital. In addition to the uh, the site you just referred us to, give us the site also for your podcast, if you will. Yeah, that's the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Great. And where Great. I interview people really who, are, who work with people who've been impacted by trauma. Really good. Yeah. Really good. Well, Guy... This is one of my favorite areas to talk about, and you're just a great guy. And you, you, it strikes me that you really want to live, and you are living with intent, this congruent life and inviting people into this community in a very inviting, genuine way and really honoring the work and the privilege of the work that we get to do with those that have gone through trauma that invite us into their lives professionally to help them walk through it in a way where they get to not have that trauma eclipse so many things in their lives the way that it has a tendency to do. I really enjoyed our time. Thank you so much for being with us today, Guy. All right, man, it was an honor. It was man. great talking to you. It's great. We're going to have you back. We're going to have that. you back for sure. And to our listeners, hey, we want to thank you as well. Thanks for being with us. And we will look forward to seeing you next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.